All right, let's go ahead and begin your test one review. Remember, your test one uh, opens up on Monday, and you'll have the entire week to complete it until midnight on Friday night or 11.59 p.m. on Friday night. Uh, the, the test, remember, is 50 multiple choice questions. You have two hours to complete it. Uh, your answers will be ram your test questions will be randomized and your answers will also be randomized so it'll try to reduce the possibility of cheating. It is open book uh, since this is an online class you have freedom to go ahead and try to sort the answers out in your textbook. Um, however remember you only have two hours so try to at least prepare a little bit ahead of time so that way you're not using the full time and you might not and that way you don't run out of time uh, towards the end. So this will be test one review. I'm going to go ahead and post this uh, over the weekend so you have time to study it over the weekend. If you don't get to it until next week, you still have time to complete the test. But we're going to go through it week by week and we're going to go ahead and start. We started on week one with talking about just politics in general. Remember we talked about what political science is and how political science is basically the study of government. If you remember from week one, political science belongs to the behavioral sciences. The behavioral sciences are a subset of sciences, much like the physical sciences or the environmental sciences, or maybe even chemistry or, or anthropology and things like that. The behavioral sciences include psychology, sociology, uh, political science, I guess also uh, cultural anthropology also belongs in there as well. Political science, though, uh, unlike the other behavioral sciences, is, is a specific discipline that focuses just on the political decisions and behavior of society and its people. If you remember from week one, there's, there was empirical political science, which relied on statistics and data to observe how the world really is and try to make conclusions from that. And then there was normative political science that looked more philosophically and looked at kind of the big picture kind of questions about justice and virtue and, and things like that, and then tried to apply those to form a policy approach. And most of the important policy questions do involve a normative factor. So keep in mind the difference between empirical and normative for your test and just basically think about political science in general and the study of government. We moved on to the definition of politics. The definition of politics uh, came from Harold Laswell, and this I can guarantee this is going to be on your test. The definition of politics from Harold Laswell is just who gets what, when, and how. So it, uh, politics really has all these moving parts of people and policies and then timelines and then policies that and then how those policies are distributed and how they get those sort of things. So definition of politics is, is, there's many, many definitions out there, but the one I, I can guarantee will be on your test and that is definitely the most important and most and probably the most simplistic way to think about it is who gets who gets what when and how we talked about different types of government as well uh, I can guarantee there'll just be a few of these on your test so be prepared for them uh, we went through autocracy uh, which only has one ruler we talked about anarchy where there is absolutely no ruler and uh, kind of results in chaos and, and un, kind of an uncertainty of where society is going and what's going on. There was tyranny uh, that was kind of like autocracy, however it was a single ruler with absolute power. So this one ruler that just has absolute power and he has so much absolute power that he just kind of disregards the citizens and you ultimately kind of get a system of anarchy even though there is a ruler in place. We talked about authoritarian governments. Authoritarian governments, they are, uh, they are tend to be a single ruler, but they are a government restrained by other social institutions. And so when we talked about authoritarian governments, we talked uh, about Iran and how Iran does have a single ruler, a kind of an authoritarian ruler. However, there's other social, there's other social institutions, specifically uh, the um, the Islamic the. Islamic institutions within Iran, they kind of restrain uh, the president or the, or the authoritarian ruler of Iran. There is totalitarian. Uh, totalitarian is is basically an autocracy. However, uh, it's ruled by one person, and then his that one person, their government, seeks to eliminate all other challengers. So there's no formal limits. There's no formal limits on what that power can hold. And the, the example that I put there was Syria. Syria is run by Bashir al-Assad, and Bashir al-Assad uh, will try to quell any rebellious activity. And so that is an example of a totalitarian government. Moving away from the one ruler types, uh, we talked about aristocracy. Uh, aristocracy is where you have leaders chosen by birth or nobility, and so a lot of, a lot of uh, 
kind of former feudal systems and things like that, those tend to fall under aristocracy. We also talked about oligarchy and where you just have like a small group of leaders or a small group of rulers and then whatever their policies are tend to only benefit that one group. And a lot of uh, military juntas and, and coup, uh, coup d'etats, like the, those sorts of governments, tend to be ol oligarchies. And then we went to the many. Uh, we talked about democracy and how uh, democracy is basically ruled by the citizens, ruled by the many, people vote in some sort of way. Now, whether that's the truest form of democracy in which you vote on every single policy uh, or whether that would be representative democracy like we have here in America where we vote on leaders and then those leaders go represent our views, those, are all, those all fall under democracy and because in some sort of way the many, the many citizens have a say in what goes on in government. There will be just a few of these on your test, so at least be sure to know a few of them and be sure to at least mix and match the different types for sure. So uh, we also moved on to week one and then we went into a little bit more about political culture and political ideology. Uh, just know the definitions of all, all of these. Um, I can guarantee there will be three separate questions probably with all of these, all of these definitions on them. So political culture we defined as broadly shared values, beliefs, and attitudes about how the government should function. So we talked about, we did talk about political values and then those, all those values and what we believe and our attitudes towards those values, that makes up our political culture. And that ultimately, our political culture ultimately shapes our way that we think about how our government should function. We talked about political efficacy. Political efficacy is a very important term for me because I believe that political efficacy really drives governments and, and it really drives the direction that governments head. Uh, because if there's a high level of political efficacy, then the public is going to be able to more influence government because there's going to be more participation and things like that. So we define political efficacy as just the public's belief that they can influence government. So in governments where you have a high level of political efficacy, the public's belief that they can influence it, then the government's more likely to listen to those people and shape, shape their policies towards what the public's belief really is. Um, and also the public will just be more responsible, more knowledgeable. And that's where political knowledge really comes in. Political, political knowledge really drives from political efficacy. Political knowledge we defined as the accumulation of information and experience about political processes. So all of this, all of the political knowledge really just is really derived from the attitudes that the public has about government, and if we have a high level, of, if we have a good attitudes toward government, and we have a, an awareness about government, and if we believe that we can actually influence government, then our knowledge will really just blossom and and, and be spread through one another. So, political knowledge um, is kind of the accumulation of all of this. So, uh, we talked about political ideology, and remember, I presented political ideology in two different terms. I, I presented it within the, wor the world scale, and then within the American political ideology. Now, I presented the political ideology of the world, I, if you remember from week one, I presented it within that line, and that line had a left-right sort of, sort of idea to it. But then also, if you remember the political circle, where you can curl up this, this line and make a circle out of it, and you kind of get the same effect where you have the extreme ends near one another and then you have liberalism in the middle. But uh, for purposes of this justice review, I'm just going to review the traditional line and this is within the world. Remember you have the extreme left over here and you have communism and now you, I often use Stalin as the, as the personification of communism. Uh, he, was a, he was a brutal dictator but he was a communist and he killed about 20 million people. And then on the extreme right we have fascism and fascism is over here, and, and I often use Hitler as the, the uh, personification of fascism. Hitler, as we all know, was a bad dude. He killed around 6 million people. So 14 million less, but still millions of people is nothing to uh, shake your head at. And so you can curl up this line uh, up here if you want to, and you can put fascism next to communism because both forms of extreme, extremism tend to lead to uh, mass killings and genocides and things like that. So extremism on either ends is, is neither good. And so uh, if you can curl them up and put them next together, you can kind of see how communism and fascism are much the same, even though they tend to be on extreme ends of one another and far away from one another when you represent it like this. Now here in the middle, remember we talked about liberalism. And liberalism, uh, remember I talked about the difference between liberalism with a small L and then liberalism with a, with a big L. And liberalism with a small L, remember if you remember from week one, uh, tends to signify just the 
classical liberalism, the ideas that John Locke talked about, about personal well, or personal dignity, uh, common sense, everyone is rational, everyone can think for themselves and things like that. Uh, when you talk with liberal, when you talk about liberalism with a big L, you're talking about uh, what people that tend to be on the American liberal side, uh, the more Democrat, tend to, tends to vote more Democrat, I shouldn't say fully votes Democrat, but tends to be more Democratic leaning and more on the uh, liberal opposite of the conservatives. Now they both believe in liberalism small L, but liberalism big L is, is much different from liberalism small L. Um, and I represented this on this line here. This would be the, the liberalism big L over here in America, and this would be the liberalism, uh, or this would be the conservatism, capital C, um, over here in America. So you can see here in America, even though we seem very divided, on considering all the ideologies in the world, we're actually very, very close to one another. But then we talked about political values. I remember, if you remember when we talked about political values, we talked about liberty and equality. And that makes up the political ideology. Here in, here in America, we tend to value either liberty and equality. And we, lib we value those in very, very different ways when you think about the different issues. So uh, hopefully you guys remember this from week one, but I'm gonna try to break this down as best as I can, as quickly as I can for the purposes of this review. Uh, remember, we broke down American issues. American issues tend to focus on either icon economics, I about said economics, economics, or social issues. And so, economic issues, we often talk about tax policies, business regulation, um, social welfare, things like that. And social issues, we tend to talk about uh, abortion, gay marriage, um, even, uh, I, I would say, marijuana legalization, things like those, those tend to be social issues. I guess even, uh, but marijuana legalization tends to have an economic factor into it as well. But if you remember that, uh, remember from week one, liberal with a capital L over here in America tends to want equality on economic issues. So they tend to focus more on uh, equality in terms of promoting welfare programs to help the poor, they tend to focus on uh, business regulation and we need to rein in corporations and corporate profits and things like that um, and make sure that there's a standard and that we just don't let corporations run rampant and, and deregulate the economy. So that would have, that's, tends to be how liberals focus on economic issues. However, on social issues, they tend to value liberty. And what I mean by that is they don't want a pure definition of traditional marriage. Uh, they don't want the government to tell them what to do in terms of abortion and things like that. So that would be the liberal, that would be the liberal side of American ideology is that they've, they focus on equality economically, but liberty, uh, liberty uh, socially. Now flip that and then you get the conservatives. And the conservatives tend to focus on liberty economically. So they don't favor business regulation at all and they don't favor uh, expanding social welfare programs and things like that. But equality on social issues is what they favor. They favor a definition of a definition of traditional marriage and they tend to focus on, uh, regula on regulating abortion laws and, and try and they tend to be more pro-life. So when we talk about why America is so divided, even though they are so close together on the world political scale, America tends to be divided because we tend to fall into either two camps. We tend to fall into either liberal or we fall into conservative. And so the reason why we're divided is because these are very, very personal in many ways, very, very personal political values. And to sacrifice a, to sacrifice a political value in one is hard enough, but to try to, to try to sacrifice both political values, try to get the conservatives to move up to here or the liberals to move up down here, it's very, very difficult because political values are something that are very dear to us and to sacrifice one and try to find middle ground is hard enough but then to sacrifice two and try to try to shift completely is very very difficult now if you do happen to sacrifice one you tend to move into these libertarian or populist camps the libertarian camp is one that values liberty both economically and socially so libertarians tend to uh tend to want deregulation of business, they don't want to expand social welfare programs, and then also they don't want, they also don't want the government to, to pander into their personal lives or their social issues either. So don't define traditional marriage, don't tell me that I can't seek an abortion, things like that. So they want, libertarians tend to want extreme liberty from government, no government interference at all. 
Well, no, that, there, often people will point out that it's kind of ironic that they don't want government at all. However, to promote libertarian ideolo ideology, you need to seek government offices. And so that's kind of a paradox in many ways. But the libertarians tend to uh, vote for candidates that, 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 that reflect their libertarian ideology. And then there are many uh, in Congress that do value that libertarian ideology. On the opposite end of libertarian is populist. And if you remember back to week one, I talked about how populism actually used to be very popular uh, within the South and within the Midwest as well. Populism wants equality on, on almost anything. And it's not that they want big government. It's just that they, they, they believe in kind of a system in which everyone is kind of equal or there's at least equally defined laws and it should apply to everyone. So the populists uh, tend to like uh, promoting social welfare programs. They want everything to be equal economically. And they also uh, want governments to regulate business and things like that. They also want equality on social issues as well because the populists, especially in the South and the Midwest, tend to, tend to come from a more Protestant tradition. And so they also want equality on social issues because they want, tr they want to define traditional marriage, uh, abortion laws, things like that. So. That's pretty much the scope of American political ideology. If you ever get confused, just follow the lines and you can see whether it's an economic issue and then whether they value equality or liberty. And you can follow whether it's a social issue and whether they value liberty and equality. Uh, also back on the week one slides, if you wanna go back then, there's also uh, further definitions and I hope that I did, I, did the, uh, just, I did justice to each political ideology and its explanation. Uh, so that's American political ideology. I, I, I won't put this square necessarily on your test, but I will have questions about which camp values equality and liberty on each of the issues. So, all right. Uh, week two, moving on to week two, we talked about Texas history just a little bit. Uh, the theme for the week was really about how Texas's history is really a story of its people. And what I mean by that is that there's always newcomers to Texas. Immigration is a consistent theme within Texas. And each era, each era of Texas history really seems to be marked by a new people moving in. And the reason why is because as soon as those new people move in, they bring new ideas about how the state should be run and what and what their political ideology is and what their cultural traditions are and things like that. And Texas really is a melting pot, a really, really a melting pot of cultures. And unfortunately, in many ways, it's also a clash of culture, a cl class of cultures. And what I mean by that is that Texas has actually experienced a fair amount of war within its history, and, and it's been a century or so since the last war. But Texas is still. Uh, has a history of war and a history of clashing of cultures between newcomers and the establishment. So we started with the we started with the very first newcomers. Uh, the first people were around 12,000 years ago. The first people crossed the land bridge over into North America around 20,000 20, years ago, and they finally reached Texas around 12,000 years ago. We talked about the Caddo people. Uh, the Caddo people were a dominant network of Native American tribes. There was a lot of different Native American tribes that made up the Caddo network. But for the most part, they were just called the Caddo people. And they were a dominant network. They were called basically the Romans of Texas because they had just this extensive network throughout Western and Southern Texas and maybe even a little bit into, into Eastern Texas. Caddo people dominated for millennia, uh, from 12,000 years ago all the way up until 500 years ago. And that's when you finally see the arrival of the Spanish around 1500. And the Spanish brought along with them uh, many, many new ideas and many new rules of law and things like that. And because they were they were uh, they were seeking out gold and riches, and they wanted to kind of plummet, they were kind of wanted to plummet the land in many ways, and they wanted to rule the land. They they thought that they were entitled to the land and established networks of the, uh, networks of of rule within Texas. And remember, if we talked specifically about the Spanish, we talked about uh, conquistadors, and we talked about the seven cities of gold. They thought that the seven cities of gold were in the Midwest, the current Midwest of the United States, somewhere. And they thought that there would be these seven cities of gold with so much wealth, and they could they would be able to take that gold back to Spain. Uh, so the Spanish were around for about five hundred, uh, sorry, around Spanish were around for about two hundred years, and then you see the the arrival of the French, and the French were really interested in Texas. They were specifically interested in in, in settling the Gulf Coast because the Gulf Coast would allow them to expand their shipping network and their trade network. The French. Uh, really had an influence along the Gulf Coast region and along the east coast or along the uh, eastern border of Texas, East Texas. And so when you look at a lot of Gulf Coast uh, cultures around here, uh, there you can see a heavy French influence as well as, well as a Spanish influence as well. 
Um, so you have this kind of neat little nice mix of Spanish and French culture around here. And I know right now Mardi Gras is going on in Galveston, so uh, it's very interesting to see the impact of French culture within this Gulf Coast region, uh, particularly for me being from Kansas and from North Texas instead of uh, down south. Uh, from seven, around 1790s, you have the arrival of the Americans, and America, mind you, was just a, a newly founded nation, and America always had an interest in expanding west. Uh, Americans, since the very the, the pilgrims and the, the Puritans arrived into America, they always had an interest in looking west and fulfilling what they called manifest destiny. And so the Americans, uh, as soon as they were termed Americans rather than British subjects, uh, they arrived into Texas around the 1790s, and they set up colonies. Um, they set up colonies in little towns and settlements and farms and things like that. And But they were in a new foreign land. They weren't in America anymore. They were in Texas. And so the, Texas at this time um, was under rule of the Spanish, but also in after 1821 was under the rule of the Mexican government. Now this created another clash of cultures between the Mexican government and the new, newly arrived Americans. And the Americans refused the loyalty to the Mexican government. The, American, uh, the Americans, uh, uniquely enough, contribute to the fight for Texas independence. Even though Texas was to be its own sovereign nation, the Americans contributed to that fight for independence for the Texans. Uh, but that also that ultimately led to the annexation. We're going to go ahead and talk about uh, different little eras within Texas. So you had Native American dominance with the Caddo people, like I've already mentioned. You had Spanish colonialization as soon as they arrived and started seeking out gold and land and things like that. And then you had an era of Mexican independence after 1821. Mexican fought, Mex Mexico fought for its independence against Spain and won in 1821 uh, with the Treaty of Hidalgo. Um, and so Texas was under rule, under Mexican rule for a little, or about 15 years uh, until 1836 when they fought for their own independence against Mexico and ultimately established the Republic of Texas. The Republic of Texas was around for nine years, uh, or some could say 10, nine to 10 years. And then you have the annexation of Texas. Texas was a huge part of President Polk's initiative to try to, an to, try to expand the United States westward and then Texas was a key part of that. So President Polk was able to successfully annex Texas, and Texas became part of the Union. Uh, that lasted for uh, 15 more years until the secession into the Confederacy. And as we all know, the, the Texas was on the side of the Confederacy. The Confederacy lost the Civil War. And then you have an era of Reconstruction and readmittance re into the Union. Then with the 20th century, you see this economic boom, economic boom, particularly because of the, uh, particularly because of more Americans moving in, the discovery of oil. You have a successful fruit uh, industry and agricultural industry, and a successful timber industry as well. So within the 20th century, Texas experiences a huge economic boom. Now it's very interesting that Texas starts off really slow. Uh, like I said, there was an era of Native American dominance for around for thousands of years. And then we go through all these newcomers and all this colonization and all these revolutions and wars within a, within a 500 year span, or many could even argue within a 100 year span, we see the formation of Texas and, and what it kind of becomes today. So where Texas is today is Texas is really experiencing a massive growth in population. Texas is growing faster than any other state. And so that's really going to be interesting in how it affects our politics. Now we're experiencing a flow uh, into Texas, a population kind of flow into Texas because of two different reasons. One, you have a lot of immigrants coming into Texas, whether they're from Latin America, and then we're also seeing a boom from Central and Eastern Europe as well. And I'm not sure exactly what explains that, but it is true that Central and, Central and Eastern Europeans tend to look at Texas as an opportunity. And it's especially affecting the Gulf Coast region and eastern Texas is basically where the, the central and eastern Europeans are settling. And then you also have in-migration from other states. A lot of people are moving from out of state into Texas, and myself included in that. I moved from Kansas into Texas. And so the, all these people moving into Texas is really going to influence the political landscape of Texas and where it may head. Texas may experience a lot of political change, particularly because the population is becoming younger, they're becoming more progressive, and it's also notable that urbanization is also an important trend because urbanization, when you get 
when you see a flow of urbanization, you tend to see more clash of cultures, people sharing ideas, and people also becoming more progressive. If, if you look at urban sites, urban sites tend to be more progressive, more liberal leaning, and more democratic. So that may influence the establishment here in Texas of the, of the Republicans and the Republican government. So it's gonna be very interesting. Texas is gonna be maybe a swing state within, within six to 10 years is what many predict. And also Texas is going to be uh, highly urbanized, and whereas it used to be very more traditional and when, more, more traditional, more agricultural. So Texas is going to experience a change in its economy as well. All right, so then we moved on to week three. Uh, week three, we talked about the Texas Constitution, and there's going to be two. There's going to be a definition of the con of what a constitution is on your test, and it'll probably, it'll probably be this first one, just so you guys know. The definition will be uh, definition of any constitution is an authoritative text that sets out the principles, authorities, and rights that are established by the government. So it's just a text. It sets out uh, sets out what we believe in. What are what can the government do, and what are the rights that the people and citizens should have? And all of these are all of these are kind of put together into this authoritative text to establish a government and what the government should be. Definition two, I really do like this one a lot, but uh, probably too little, too short, and too and too narrow to put on your test. Um, to your test, but definition two is just a written charter that sets forth the limits of government. And those tend to be the Bill of Rights and things like that, uh, because you want to put limits on a government. That way, it's not a complete tier. It's not a complete uh, authoritarian system. Um, going back to the definition of Harold Laswell of what politics is, uh, constitutions do set out the limits on who gets to do what, to whom, and how, uh, much like Harold Laswell's definition of politics, who gets who gets what, when, and how. And really, the Constitution kind of outlines that and kind of sets up the future of the government in many ways. Functions of the Constitution, we went ahead and talked about this on week three. Functions of the Constitution, you want to, one, you want to establish the legitimacy of government. You want to establish institutions and machinery of government. You want to allocate powers to institutions and you want to place limits on the use of power. All of these are supposed to be within a constitution. You want to establish the legitimacy of government. You want to say that this government is legitimate and this is this is what's going to be part of it. And that's, that's part of establishing institutions of machinery government. You want to establish institutions such as a presidency, a Congress, a judiciary. And you also want to establish the machinery of government. How is this institution going to function? Uh, what is it comprised of? Who can be a part of it? Uh, what are the different cogs within the machine of government? You want to allocate powers to institutions. You want to tell that this institution can do this, this institution can't do that. This institution can do this, this institution can't do that. You also want to place limits on the use of power. You want to you want to be sure that your citizens have certain rights and freedoms from government and certain protections as well. So this question will definitely be on your test. It'll be something like what which one of these is not a function of a constitution? And you would answer whichever one isn't one of these four. There was different philosophies behind constitutions, and I can guarantee there'll be a question about each of these on your test. Uh, there's either rationalism or realism, and we'll just review these very briefly. Rationalism, uh, it sees men, it sees man, sorry, it sees man as a rational being, and that government is just a logical extension. The constitution is just a basic instrument of the social contract. So this is also called a liberal constitution. Remember, it's liberal with a small l. And the reason why is because John Locke is the one that really thought of this philosophy. John Locke thought of man as a rational being, that man can think for itself and man can do as he pleases. What, what, why we need to establish a government is so that the government can, can ensure that man can continue being a rational being. Government is there to ensure that man can continue to pursue happiness. He can, consider, he can continue to seek life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Government is there to do that for him. The government is there to kind of take on a little bit of the burden of, of daily life so that man can continue doing as he wishes. Um, and so you can kind of see how this plays out in, in modern America, where the government kind of takes care of our day-to-day our -day things for us. That way we don't have to worry about uh, foreign policy all the time. Instead, we can watch YouTube videos and, and do, what, do as we wish. We can be on Facebook and Twitter and things like that. Uh, the government goes goes ahead and takes part takes care of you know say the tre the treasury and the taxes and and um, governing basically. On the flip side, there uh, another philosophy is realism, and this one was set up by um, 
Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes was this philosopher, and when what he thought was, uh, he thought of realism, and he thought as he thought of men as basically evil. And if man is basically evil, the reason why we need to establish a government is because government is a means of social control. Government is there in many ways to protect us, whereas rationalism sees government as being a good thing and taking care of us, uh, taking taking care of certain duties for us so that we don't have to worry about them. Uh, Hobbes really saw government as a means of social control, and what what he mean by that is that if man is basically evil, the government is there to punish the evildoers for us. Uh, there to ensure basically social order. You know, constitution is a means of controlling government. So uh, the constitution is there to control government, tell government that they need to punish these people for us, so that we don't have this system of anarchy and people are just killing each other for resources. The government needs to ensure that there's access to resources and also punish those that maybe maybe step out of line as well. So that would be rationalism versus realism. Uh, there'll be a definition of each of these on your, on your test. The question will be something like, which one sees man as a rational being? Which one sees man as basically evil? And hopefully you can be able to answer those respectively. We talked about the different constitutions of Texas. Um, I won't ask you specifically which ones did what. Um, except for probably the 1866 one. The 1866 one is really important because this was the first time that uh, slavery had been outlawed in Texas, and that's, that's a very basic principle going forward in American politics that slavery is outlawed here in the United States. Uh, the very first one, though, moving back to up, up here to the top, the 1836 was, was the very first constitution in Texas. It was the first time that Texas had been independent, free from uh, colonial rule or, or colonialism in any sort of way. Um, so we established our very first constitution with the Republic of Texas. It established a unitary government. If you remember from the federalism lecture, which we're going to review here in just a little bit, unitary just means there's one federal kind of government. There's not one little, there's not regional government. So Texas was its own nation, and we had one unitary government that oversaw all of Texas rather than just the state governments. So it set up a unitary government, set up a bicameral legislature, and it set up the rationalist, rationalistic framework. So it took a lot from John Locke and his rationalistic framework, or his rationalistic, excuse me, rationalistic uh, philosophy on the Constitution. 1845, uh, you had the first state constitution. This was the first time that we belonged as a state to, anyone, to uh, the United States. And we based it largely on Mississippi and Tennessee's constitution. You still had the bicameral legislator, but instead of a president of Texas, you had a governor of Texas. 1861, we secede to the Confederacy, and we had established the Confederate Constitution. It's very similar to the 1845 Constitution in many ways, except that they had to uh, swear allegiance to the Confederacy rather than the Union. 1866, we had the Presidential Reconstruction Constitution. This was right after the Civil War. Uh, Texas is suffering economically, and we need to go through an era of Reconstruction so that we can regain admittance into the Union. The 1866 one, the most, like I said, the most one, the one that's most important about the 1866 one is that it's outlawed. It outlawed slavery because we wanted, we needed to outlaw slavery so that the union would be able to accept us. We outlawed slavery with the 1866 Constitution, and in 1869 we established a new constitution, the Radical Republican, the Radical Republican Constitution, and we established it because we wanted to be admitted to the union, and this was, uh, it was a good enough constitution, good enough constitution for the Congress to accept it and say, hey, welcome back, Texas, you're welcome back into the union. And then in 1876, uh, we established our present constitution. So the constitution that we have today goes all the way back in, back, all the way back to 1876. We haven't changed it yet. Now that's not to say there hasn't been calls to change it, because there, there definitely has. But with the 1876 constitution, we, we, this is the one that we still have today. It establishes the concept of popular sovereignty, uh, meaning that the people can vote and influence government, and the government should derive its powers from the people. And we also establish the separation of powers from the, we establish the governor, the judiciary, and the legislator. And we also adopt this concept of limited government. And limited government uh, is really kind of an ideal that is held in high esteem here in Texas, particularly being a more, more conservative state. We talked about the Texas Bill of Rights. Uh, just note that the Texas Bill of Rights is different than the U.S. Bill of Rights. The Texas Bill of Rights has a lot of a lot of things that are similar, but also a lot of things that are, may be different. And so it's different than the U.S. Bill of Rights, and it's particularly different than the U.S. Bill of Rights because it's not in the amendments. The U.S. Bill of Rights sets within our amendments one through ten. Those are what's called our Bill of Rights here in the U.S. 
However, Texas thought that the Bill of Rights was so important that they put it in Article One, the very, very first thing within the Constitution. And so they didn't leave the Bill of Rights till later, like our founding fathers did. They said, we want to address these things right away. We want to address our rights. We want to address our freedom from government. Because Texas at this time was so concerned about big government. And it's really kind of an ideal that's really held on here in Texas. So that's why it shows the typical Texans distrust of government. Like I said, it has many similarities to the Federal Bill of Rights. Uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, uh, protection against search and seizure, double jeopardy, fair and speedy trial, as well as many others. Uh, there's a long list, I couldn't put them all within this slide. But it also has several oddities as well that are not normally contained in a normal Bill of Rights, uh, such as it talks about debts, and it talks about prison sentences, and it talks about things like that. We talked a little bit about how to amend the Constitution, and many of you found really good amendments to the Constitution. Uh, I really did appreciate that within your discussion boards. You did a really good job with that. Uh, the amendment process, though, remember you have a kind of a four-step process. You have submission, uh, and that just means that uh, two-thirds vote of each of the House of the Texas Legislature find that this issue is important and that maybe we need to add it into the, into the Constitution. As soon as they vote for it by two-thirds, um, we go through a period of kind of advertisement where it's, it's put out into the public, and the public can kind of advertise whether they want this in the Constitution or not. And that's often the advertisement period leads up to an election. So you often hear about Texas amendments uh, within the months before an election, usually within September and October, because the Texas legislature meets in the summer, and so uh, the period of advertisement happens then. As soon as, as the advertisement period is over and the election day comes, you have an election. And all you need is you just need a majority of the voters to vote on the proposed amendment. So once this election happens, a majority of voters vote on it, either yay or nay. If they vote yes, it goes into the, it goes into the Texas Constitution. If they vote no, it's omitted. But if it does, uh, the votes are in favor of this amendment, then you have a proclamation by either the governor or the secretary of state, and then it's added into the Constitution formally so weaknesses of the current constitution we talked a little bit about this uh, we talked about the fragmentation of authority uh, you have a fragmentation of authority within the executive branch and also within the local governments and what i mean by fragmentation of authority is that it really divides responsibility among a lot of people and while that may be good because you have people that are very highly specialized and focused on just their job and what they need to do within the government it also creates a lot of people that need to meet at once, and it creates a kind of a difficulty in communicating. There's a very difficult communicating, and you know, this office is so specialized that can't relay information to this other office and things like that. We also have re ex excessive restrictions on legislative and executive authority. The legislative branch only meets once every two years, and it that has very little power. The executive branch also has very little power as well. Most of the power within Texas resides within the bureaucracy, and so we're going to go ahead and talk about that later in the semester. Just know that ex excessive restrictions is one of the problems within the, within the current Texas Constitution. And we also have excessive detail. The Texas Constitution is highly, highly detailed, and it has a lot of legal, uh, a, a lot of le legal lingo, I guess, I guess I'll say, uh, a lot of legal terms, and it's very confusing. It's very excessive in detail. And that's why it's also one of the most wordy. It's one of the most wordy constitutions. It's the longest constitution. When you add all the amendments in, it's over 300,000 words. So to read the entire Texas constitution is like reading a, a large book. And so the average citizen is, has a lot of difficulty in understanding the Texas constitution and what exactly is going on with it. So that's one downfall of the current constitution. We moved on to week four. Uh, with week four, we talked about federalism and a lot of important court cases and things like that. Federalism, uh, we broke it down. We broke down si different systems of government, different government types. We talked about a confederation system. We talked about a unitary system. And then we talked about federalism. So confederation system uh, is just where states have most of the authority. You do have one national government, but that national government is very, very weak and has very, very little power. And this was the example of this that I put, put forth was the U.S. under the Articles of Confederation. The U.S. had a confederation system under the Articles of Confederation. It didn't really work out too well because you had states that were, couldn't coordinate with one another. You had states trying to establish their own currency. Um, you had states with their own tax policies and things like that. And so there's a lot of kind of chaos, and it really fell apart. And confederation systems often do because it's very hard to, 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 to communicate and 
coordinate with one another. So that's why within the world you find very few examples of a confederation system. We talked about the unitary system, which is kind of the opposite of the confederation system. Instead of the states having most of the power, within a unitary system, the majority of authority is within the control of the national government. So you have one national government, and you may have state and local governments, but they don't have a lot of power. They kind of just administer the rules. And the national government is the one that's actually in charge of governing. Uh, examples that I put forth were Indonesia, Indi uh, the United Kingdom, France, Italy, and Japan. And if you remember from the lecture that I said that most parliamentary systems tend to be a uh, unitary system, well, most of these are parliamentary systems. Federalism, though, is when you combine. When you combine a confederation system and a unitary system, you kind of meet in the middle and you get federalism. And this is where you just have powers granted to each level of government over the same body of citizens. So you have different levels of government. Each level of government have different powers. You have a federal power, and then you have a state power. We broke this down into two little columns here, and so we're going to tackle the one on the left here with the federal government. Um, the federal government has specific powers, and they're listed within Article 1, Section 8. And if you remember also from the lecture, I added on the 14th Amendment as well. That's also now a, a federal power. Article 1, Section 8 outlines the taxing and spending clause, the Commerce Clause and the Necessary and Proper Clause. Those are the, the, th the three expressed powers for the federal government. I can guarantee that will be on your test. Uh, the federal government has the power to tax and spend. They also have the power to promote interstate commerce, sometimes interstate if there's a national interest at hand, and also what is ever, whatever is necessary and proper for the welfare of the nation. We talked about Article 6, how Article 6 says that the federal law is the supreme law of the land, and if there's ever a dispute over what, which one should go, which one is better, or which one is supreme, or which one tops the other one, uh, if there's ever a dispute over that, the federal law trumps the state law. Now, state can make a, can, states can make a law that, that kind of contradicts federal laws, as many have had with many other issues, but if it ever goes to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has to adhere to the federal law over the state law. That's not to say that states don't have certain powers, and so let's move over here onto the right side. State governments can retain the remainder of power that's not allocated to the national government. So state governments, whatever, state governments have whatever power is not expressed within this constitution or within these th three powers. If it's not within these three powers, then the state governments have the power to control that. The examples that I put forth uh, within the lecture were elections, school curriculums, marriage, licenses, local government, things like that. And it all comes from the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment is the one that gives states the power. The Tenth Amendment says power, powers not expressed in the Constitution are reserved to the states or to the people. And so the states really derive their power from the Tenth, the tenth Amendment. And so states have certain powers, the federal government has certain powers, and that's just the concept of federalism. We talked about uh, different types of powers. I put in the lecture, uh, forgive me for this, I put uh, express powers. Uh, I also have, del you can also call them delegated powers as well. So expressed or delegated powers, those are powers that are delegated to the national government by the Constitution. So you have the taxing and spending, the Commerce Clause, Necessary and Proper, and then the 14th Amendment. Those are the powers that are delegated or expressed to the national government. Now you can also meet in the middle with concurrent powers, and those are powers exercised by both states and the federal government. Both the state and the federal government engage in taxing. Both the state and the federal government engage in building highways. Both of them uh, kind of are involved in policing as well. I brought many other examples, so if you want to review the lecture and me memorize all those, feel free to do so. Uh, but there are a lot of concurrent powers beyond just these three. Uh, but these, for sake of uh, for sake of brevity, I just put these these three powers in. Now there's reserve powers also, and those are those are powers that are just reserved to the states. Uh, powers the states always determine the education curriculum. They tend to uh, determine marriage laws, and they're also the ones that set up the local governments. Uh, there's a lot more powers that I put into the states. Um, you can review those if you want to as well. And just know, please, what delegated powers are, what concurrent powers are, and what reserved powers are. Then we went into a lot of court cases, and, and I can guarantee there will be a few questions about these court cases because these court cases are very important in the way federalism has functioned or has moved forward in America. The very first one that we brought up uh, was McCulloch versus Maryland. Uh, the federal government can charter a national bank because it was necessary and proper to do so, and states cannot tax national banks. 
so that was the one that established the necessary and proper clause for the federal government. Remember, Maryland wanted to tax the National Bank to death because they didn't like the National Bank imposing on their, they thought it imposed on their rights as a state. Um, but the, so it was found that Maryland couldn't do that because the power to tax is the power, the power to kill, basically. We talked about U.S. versus Lopez. We've talked about gun regulation. This one will be on your test for sure, particularly because it happened in Texas, and it's very important, and, and guns are definitely a, a hot-button issue here in Texas. So U.S. versus Lopez uh, said that the federal government cannot regulate firearms that stay within state boundaries and that the U.S. government cannot reg regulate firearms specifically because it does not meet the criteria of the Commerce Clause. You can't show that gun regulation has anything to do with the economy or interstate commerce in any way. Um, so the U.S. is it can't regulate the federal government cannot regulate firearms that as long as they stay within within the state and they do not disrupt the economy in any sort of way. We talked about Arizona versus the U.S. This is very important, particularly for Texas government because uh, Texas is a border state. They have a huge immigration issue, and Arizona was is also a border state, and they took on the immigration issue for the other border states, basically. Uh, remember this one said that only the federal government can regulate and enforce immigration law. So that's very important for Texas because now Texas, uh, after this ruling, Texas cannot establish laws to regulate immigration law. They have to rely on the federal government to go ahead and do that because the federal government is the one that deals with immigration and deals with, deals with policies that happen to deal with foreign nations. So if it's a foreign nation, only the United States can deal with it, not the states. And because you have many immigrants coming from foreign nations, the United States has to deal with it, not the Texas government. We also talked about health care as well with Florida versus the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, remember this one. This one was very important, uh, particularly, for your, particularly for you college students, because you guys are going to deal with health care, and, and health insurance is definitely going to affect you, uh, if not now, definitely later on, uh, particularly as you are kind of weaned off of your parents' health insurance in many ways. So uh, remember this talked about the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare, whichever one you want to call it. Um, the thing the thing was that it was questioned whether the co whether Congress and the federal government can pass the Affordable Care Act or enforce the Affordable Care Act under the Commerce Clause or the Taxing and Spending Clause. And we came back with a unique decision. Congress cannot pass the ACA under under the Commerce Clause but it can under taxing and spending. It was seen by the Roberts Court that individual mandate was a tax and the fee was not a huge burden. So Congress can pass the Commerce Clause, can pass the Affordable Care Act because it's a taxing and spending regulation rather than a rather than an interstate commerce thing. So that's why the Affordable Care Act is 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 around and that's why we have to pay for health insurance, or at least your parents do, and you are under your parents' health insurance. Um, now, whether you think that whether you're against that or for that, that's, that's either way. But for now, people have to buy health insurance in order to have it. So that way, in case there is an emergency visit or thing like that, there's a way to pay for it. We also talked about U.S. versus Reich. We talked about marijuana legalization. U.S. versus Reich was a very important case, uh, particularly. Um, for, for those that believe in states' rights to have marijuana laws and things like that. The U.S. versus Reich in 2005 the, basically said that the federal government can regulate uh, medicinal marijuana even if it's purely interstate. And the reason why is because failure to regulate in one state could lead to a widespread distribution or abuse nationally. So the U.S. government felt that it needed to stop the growth of marijuana uh, or medicinal cannabis within California, because if we don't stop in California, it'll spread elsewhere, and then it's a huge national problem. And remember when we talked about marijuana legalization, remember that often states, state laws contradict federal laws, and that's why when this came to the U.S. court, or to the U.S. Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court had to side on the side of the U.S. because the federal law is supreme to the state law. And this is going to be very interesting how this plays out in the future. For now, the Obama administration has backed off and not enforced the U.S. the U.S. federal law on marijuana, uh, and let states kind of experiment and, and utilize those laboratories of democracy that we talked about. But uh, at least in 2005, the Supreme Court sided on the side of the U.S. Uh, we talked about the 14th Amendment. Remember, the 14th Amendment grants the federal government an additional power. The 14th Amendment was there to stop. 
uh, states from discriminating against its own citizens. And the federal that was kind of seen as a way for the federal government to limit what states can do individually. And kind of in many ways, it's kind of an impeachment or impediment, I guess, on state states' rights. But that being said, being non-discriminatory, having non-discriminatory states and allowing new freed slaves and new civil rights movements to happen was very important to the U.S. government at that time. And ultimately, the 14th Amendment was intended to prevent discrimination of, of minorities in many ways. 14th Amendment is still around, obviously, and it still uh, could be enforced if we see some sort of discrimination in the future and the federal government needs to step in. We talked about local governments. Local governments are very important. We're going to talk about local governments. We're going to have an entire lecture on local governments later on in the semester. But in terms of federalism, it's important to note that local governments are not in the Constitution. Um, so local governments are not in the Constitution. Uh, but that being said, they're very important to the system of federalism because without local governments, you don't have a state government. And without state governments, you don't have a, you don't have a federal system. And you don't have a system of federalism either. We talked about the different types of federalism. There was layer cake uh, federalism, which is also called dual federalism. You have, and that's kind of a system where you have the national government at top and the state government on the bottom, and you don't have a lot of interaction between the two. That changed with the Great Depression uh, when states began relying on the federal government for grants and help, and that set up a system of marble cake federalism. With marble cake federalism, also called cooperative federalism, um, you have the federal government handing out grants, handing out jobs, helping the economies of the state, and setting up regulations of the state as well. So the very first big program that set up marble cake federalism was the New Deal. You have grants and aid. Grants and aid have increased dramatically. You remember that one chart that I showed you where grants have increased exponentially? Keep that in mind. I'm gonna have a question about how, what the trend in grants and aid has been, and you would say that it's increased exponentially. Also keep in mind the term devolution. Devolution is the term uh, giving power back to the states, and this is the trend that we've also seen uh, within the system of federalism as well. So while we're giving power back to the states, uh, the federal government is, is really still does have a hand in the power of the states because the federal government is the one with the money, and uh, they're giving the money to the states and then telling them that you have the power to do with this money as you wish. So even though currently in this system of federalism that we're in, we're giving power back to the states, the federal government does have a huge hand in that because they're, they're, ones with, they're the ones handing out these grants and aid also. So I believe that's the last slide. Yes, it is. Um, so remember, your test is next week. Uh, if you, uh, you, sorry, your test, your test is next week. You have the entire week to complete it. I'm going to release it on midnight on Monday. So if you want to take it right away, feel free. But you do have the whole week to study. Um, you have the whole week to watch my lectures again and review the material. Um, and you also have the opportunity to watch this, this review lecture as well. So take your time. You have, a two week, you have two hours to complete it. It's 50 multiple choice questions. It's also open book, but I would definitely recommend preparing beforehand. All right. So if you have any questions about the test, the format of the test, anything like that, feel free to email me, call me, Skype me. Uh, Find me on social media. Yeah, we also have my phone number as well. There's many ways to get a hold of me. I embrace all forms of technology. So any ways you want to get a hold of me, uh, feel free to do so. All right. Uh, good luck on your test. And I'll go ahead and close out this lecture.